Excellence is not something far away and unattainable. It's a practical concept. It's being aware of the value of the world surrounding us. It's simply a daily commitment. Nothing's more contagious than enthusiasm and passion. Nothing we do can leave this aside. L'Aniteur in Etinere is our ongoing journey. A voyage to create a wine that goes far beyond what it was originally meant to be. Falling in love with the territory is the beginning point of this journey. Knowing that everything starts from here, the meeting point of past and present. A true relationship based on respect. Our passion is rewarded many times over by the generosity of the land, celebrating the scents and fruity aromas of the fragrant grapes. Harvesting and processing grapes in the cellars without ever forgetting the work done out in the vineyards. The knowledge coming from tradition is shaped by research and technology. It's a job done with care, no compromises, no shortcuts. These are the values that have always inspired Carlo and Adriana Biasiotto and family towards that special dedication for coming up with a wine that speaks for itself, a wine that can charm and beguile the senses ever since the first encounter. Fos Murai embraces the aesthetics of taste. The glamorous custom style of the bottles gives a personal touch purposely designed to distinguish itself from others and state its uniqueness. Leneter in itinere. The journey goes on between vision and creativity, setting off from Guia and crossing the world and becoming an ambassador of taste and sheer Italian class.
Venice. The city is like no other. Since its beginning, it quickly became a center of influence and power. Its many waterways and canals slowly reveal its glorious past. Today, it's a must-see destination for tourists from around the globe. Venice, in medieval times, was one of the most important ports in the Mediterranean and had an influence on the wine trade. Later, as the region developed its own winemaking culture, Veneto adopted a Greek technique of making wines from dried grapes, called a passimento. This continues to be a factor that makes the wines from this region unique and extremely popular. The vineyards of the Veneto wine region are renowned for a family of wines. In ascending depth and body, they are Bardolino, Valpolicella, Ripasso, and Damarone. All members of this wine family start with the same blend of grapes, Corevina, Rondinella, and Molinara, picked at their peak of ripeness, and the best examples come from the hills of Valpolicella Classico. Ripasso is a Valpolicella wine that has been given more depth through a second fermentation using dried grapes, while Amarone is a product of the ancient winemaking method of Apassimento. Gargagnago is just in the center of the classic Valpolicella area. This is Dr. Sandro Boscaini, president at Mazzi Agricola, a leading producer in the region. The Apassimento process has been updated significantly since ancient times relying on temperature and humidity controls to ensure quality. We start with the same grapes called Vina Rondinella Molinara, but we can uh, pick and, uh, and uh, crush fresh, making immediate fermentation, uh, now at the picking time, and we have Valpulicella. Then Valpulicella can be also aged and become Valpulicella Superiore, and this classico when it comes from the hillside area where we are now, our vineyards, Masi, are totally in the classic area. Appassimento is totally made with the dry grapes, the same grapes we pick at the same time now, and then when the grapes have lost 40% of the original weight, creating a severe concentration, and we have a totally dry wine, which is Amarone. Ah, the Amarone. Just south of Valpolicella is Verona, the city of love, the setting of Romeo and Juliet. I've come back here to look up an old love of my own, one I met many years ago, the famous Amarone. Music is everywhere in this historic city known for its love of opera. And this is one of its most famous landmarks. For hundreds of years, Antica Bottega del Vino has been home to artists, poets, and one of the greatest sellers in Italy. It's like a shrine to the great Italian vintages. Severino Barzani oversees the extensive collection. He too is captivated by the region's Amarones and loves to extol their virtues. Amarone was something special for the families. Not a one to drink every day, just for the special events, I mean, the family, you know, for Christmas. It's a special yeah. occasion. Special occasions. When I try Amarone, I know they're made from the same grapes, from the same area, but where do they get their character? This is terroir, the different terroir are gonna give you a lot more cherry, more peach, or body. It depends on the terroir, it depends on the soil and depends on the philosophy of the winemaker, of the family. They can, I mean, 15 days more, 15 days less of drying them up, makes a difference. Tamarone. Tamarone, salute. Salute. The Valpolicella region has it all. And here's a great example, the Valpolicella family. We start with Valpolicella, and you can see the density of color on each of these increases as we go up the range. Valpolicella, Ripasso, and Amarone 
All three of these wines are made from the same grapes, but as we go up the family tree, you'll see that color density increases, as does the flavor characteristics. With Valpolicella, we have lighter bodied fruity wines with wonderful cherry, little bit of spice. As we get into Ripasso, because of the drying process, these are a little more intense, rounder on the mouth, more concentrated flavors, all the way up to Amarone. And these are complex wines with plummy cherry fruit, earthy characteristics and spice. These are ideal for braised meats and strong cheeses. The alpine meadows of Alto Adige seem a world away from the rest of Italy. Over the years, the white wines from this region have been miscast as lightweights, but their reputation is changing. The air is fresh, crisp and clean. That same description could be used for the wines of the area. We're in Italy's most northern wine-growing region, at the 46th parallel to be exact, and vineyards are planted up to a thousand meters above sea level. However, in the summertime, these narrow alpine valleys trap the heat, and temperatures can exceed 30 degrees Celsius. When the fall harvest concludes, the winery team at Alois Lagadar assembles in the vineyards to rejuvenate the soil. They adhere to the principles of biodynamics, the most holistic form of organic viticulture. Alois Legadar, fifth generation owner of the winery, is committed to sustainable production. We lost in the last 200 years a biological balance we have in the free world, in the free nature, in the forest. So uh, what we are trying to achieve, to bring back the plant, the vine, to this uh, balance. Developed in the 1920s by Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian philosopher and social reformist, biodynamic production seeks to heal and revitalize the earth using natural techniques. Buried manure will ferment in cow horns and in months to come will be extracted and then sprayed on the vineyards. This region was once part of Austria, known as South Tyrol, and you can still see these influences today. I think we have the natural conditions to produce wines with great elegance. The acidity is there, but it's well integrated in the body, and the body is, is well structured. We have a good complexity. And so the wines are also round and soft without having any residual sugar. The Alto Adige area produces a range of white wines. And here are three great examples. We have a Pinot Grigio, a Riesling, and Gewürztraminer. All three are much richer and more complex than you might expect for white wines of Italy. Let's look at the Pinot Grigio. Beautiful straw gold with light green tints on the edge. Wonderful varietal characteristics on the nose and you get that minerality. Mm. On the palate, it's really quite rich and complex. Real creamy long finish. You could actually age this wine for another four to six years. But if you want to enjoy it, Try it with roasted white meats or shellfish. In contrast to style, these vineyards in the neighboring region of Friuli can produce wines with a more contemplative side, expressing not only the purity of the fruit, but also the philosophy of the winemaker. In Italy's extreme northeast, the region of Friuli shares a border with Austria to the north and Slovenia to the east. The wines of these hills did not receive much attention until the modernization movement, which began in the 1960s. A handful of innovators, like the Yermann family, embraced technology, temperature-controlled fermentation, to preserve the fresh and subtle fruit flavors of white varieties like Frugliano, Traminer, and Pinot Grigio. These vineyards are meticulously managed, a clear indication of quality production. However, the character of the fruit changes dramatically from the flat areas to the steep hillside plots. Michele Yerman explains. In, uh, in the flat it's more acidity, it's more uh, freshness of the wines, and here it's more structure, it's more body, it's more uh, passion inside the wines. Four generations of talent and passion have resulted in excellent value and quality in these great northern whites. Friuli is known for producing white wines. Usually they're lighter, easy to drink. 
But there's another end of that spectrum, and Dreams is a great example. Deep, golden, you know this wine has spent time in wood. On the nose, it's powerful. You get the vanilla, you get the nuttiness, and that lovely toastiness coming through. Mm. Rich, creamy on the palate, wonderful acidity, beautifully balanced, which is a hallmark of a quality white wine. This wine will sell her for another eight or 10 years, or if you want to drink it now, have it with Lobster Thermidor. Here in Northern Italy, as we get closer to the Alps, the climate is generally cooler. And where you find cool climate winemaking, there's usually a thriving sparkling wine scene. Asti was my first introduction to Italian sparkling, but I want to show you Prosecco, brimming with melon and citrus and loved across the globe. It's easy to see why. There's a freshness that I find captivating. At the same time, it's casual. There's no pretension and it's great value. The grape variety is gladder. Today, Prosecco is usually done in a dry or off-dry style, and it's no wonder it's becoming the world's most popular sparkling wine. This is the valley of Cartice, where the finest Glera grapes are grown. Prosecco wines are produced under DOC, DOCG, and CRU designations for the grapes that come from the south-faced hillsides in the Cartice. Antonio Motoran is general manager at Carpeni Malvolte. People here, 100 years ago, they were poor. But after, they discovered that it was possible to produce here a very interesting wine. And today, you see, there are some total mountains covered by vines. It's vines everywhere. Everywhere. In 2009, for the first time, Italy surpassed France as the leader in sparkling wine production, largely due to the popularity of Prosecco. Inexpensive and ideal as an aperitivo, Prosecco is made using the Charmat method. The young wine is re-fermented in these pressurized tanks and meant to be consumed young and fresh. Antonio, help me understand what people love so much about this wine. It's very easy to drink. For example, Champagne is fantastic sparkling wine. A lot of perfumes is complicated. Prosecco is very easy. People like to be happy, to have a not complicated life. When you drink Prosecco, you drink a little of Italy. We're not finished with sparkling wine yet. Beyond Prosecco and Asti, in the territory of Franci e Corta, just west of Veneto, is another of Italy's great but underappreciated wines. Beyond these gates at Ca del Bosco, a stunning symbol of the relationship between art and wine, is a technological wonder where they make one of the world's greatest sparkling wines. You have all of the ingredients, what more could you ask for? Yeah, we have to have your philosophy and concentrate on the quality because uh, the winemaking is always secondary to the grapes. Franci e Corta became the first DOC to specify that its sparkling wines must be made by the Metodo Classico. The method of sparkling wine production where the second fermentation must take place in the bottle. The stony soils planted with Chardonnay, Pinot Bianco and Pinot Nero produce wines that are dry, elegant and poised. To put the vine in a difficult position in order to be always a little bit suffering, uh, because suffering the vine produce better uh, and produce less. The roots with this kind of soil they are obliged to go deeper and going deeper they eat better. When picked they're fermented in at least 16 separate batches. The base wines are then blended to form a cuvee. The all-important second fermentation takes place in bottles in the underground cellars. The wine then rests on the yeast for a very long period, at least six and a half years, until it's disgorged to remove the yeast and then recorked. When we think about the sparkling wines of Italy, the prestige cuvées of Franciacorta can stand shoulder to shoulder with the best sparkling wines in the world. 
Here we have the Anna Maria Clemente. Look at that beautiful deep golden color, much richer than we saw from Prosecco. The nose is really intense, lots of ripe apple, spice, toastiness, and just a hint of oak. Mm. Much richer and creamier than Prosecco. Really intense and complex flavors on the palate. Again, you get that apple, toast, a little bit of smokiness, and a touch of oak. Beautiful long finish. It's said that the best wines are a true expression of place, and that's certainly the case in Piemonte, where success in wine growing is determined by subtle differences through the locations across these hillsides. For wine lovers around the world, these hills represent the promised land, Barolo and Barbarasco. Over the centuries, these vineyards have been parceled according to their relationship to the sun, and this slope is one of the best in Barbarasco called Il Brico. This is Cesare Benvenuto, from the winery of Pio Cesare. Il Brico means, uh, in our own dialect, the, the peak of the hill, so in fact... It's right on top. Yes, it's really the peak of the hill, uh, of this hill of the Barbaresco area. And thanks to this 100% uh, self-exposure, we can grow such a uh, great Nebbiolo bunches of grape. It's a very light-colored grape. It's almost translucent. Yes, this is a, one of the reasons why we have a, a very uh, a long maceration with the skin contact. And the skin is a, a very important uh, uh, matter for, uh, for, uh, for Nebbiolo because, as you can see here, you see here, you can have a look over here, is the skin of Nebbiolo is very, very thin. It's very thin. Uh, and as much as uh, uh, contact with, uh, with the sun, you can uh, have uh, the the best quality. So with and such then, with such a thin-skinned grape, how do you get such color extract in the wine? Because uh, the color is very is very light, but uh, thanks to the sun, thanks to the soil, and thanks to this uh, almost 28, 30 days of uh, maceration with the skin content, we can have uh, such a great color also on the Barolo and Barbaresco. The origins of its name are somewhat unknown. Maybe it's the veil of fog that forms over the maturing berries. Nebbia is Italian for fog, or the word nobile, meaning noble in English. In either case, Nebbiolo is synonymous with quality. Prized by collectors for its long age ability, it's not uncommon for some Barolos to sell her for 30 or 40 years. There's no doubt that Nebbiolo is one of the great varieties of Italy if not the world. In the wine business, Barolo and Barbaresco are very well known for the unbelievable aging potential. In fact, at the first sight, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tannic, uh, with a very nice acidity. But uh, step by step, uh, when you uh, taste Barolo many times, or Barbaresco many times, you will be totally uh, conquested by uh, the great flavor of uh, this unique grape variety. The region of Piemonte sits in northwestern Italy along the French-Swiss border. The growing areas for the great wines of Barolo and Barbaresco are centered around the town of Alba. These are not big wines in the same sense as a California Cabernet or Australian Shiraz. The powerful structure and high alcohol of Nebbiola wines impacts an impression of strength and weight. And the finest examples? They show balance, elegance, and an emphasis on perfume and spice that's really hard to sum up in one word. Michele Chiarlo is another of the region's accomplished producers, and he's a man who's intimately acquainted with his land. Today he's on a hunt. This dog was selected from many for his exceptional nose and specially trained to locate the rarest and most expensive food on earth. The elusive white truffle of Alba. 
<laughs> well done. <laughs> Cherished by chefs around the globe, they sell for over $5,000 per kilo. And like the great wines, people will pay for the best. Uh, we'll eat well tonight. <laughs> this region grows other grapes like Barbera and Dolcetto, but Michele focuses on one varietal that reaches its pinnacle in the soils he knows best. So this is all Barolo here. All Barolo it is the most prestigious area, it is the most prestigious single vineyard. It's really a small area too. Very small area. It is uh, 1,800 hectares. For decades now, a feud has been brewing in these hills between the so-called modernist and traditionalist over the Barolo style. The modern approach seeks to make wines fruitier and younger drinking by shortening skin contact and fermentation, reducing aging time, and using more French barrique casks instead of the large oak bote. Tasting these young Barolos with Michele and his son Stefano, it's clear they represent the best of both worlds. Modern technique rooted in tradition. I discovered Barolo 60 years ago. Because Barolo it is a great surprise. But uh, my great surprise is to taste Barolo when you have 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Every time you have a great evolution. The bouquet, but it remains always very fresh bouquet. Very fresh, complex, with a lot of character. When it started young, it is more fruity. When you arrive at uh, 10 years, you have more spices. If you put in front of you a glass of Barolo, you taste it for one hour consecutive, you discover always the new sensation. For me, this is a complexity. Let's try two great wines from Piemonte, Barbaresco and Barolo. Barbaresco is known as the queen. Both of these wines are made from the same grape variety, Nebbiolo. We look at this beautiful garnet color, on the nose, you get a lot of deep forest fruit, like blackberries, blueberries, spice, leather. Quite full-bodied, but really silky. It's beautifully integrated. This is probably the more versatile of the two wines. It's great with game, it's great with lighter meats, and it's fantastic with aged cheeses. The King, Barolo, made from Nebbiolo, Beautiful garnet color. One of the things to remember with Barolo is these wines can change dramatically when they're grown from vineyards that are just meters apart. This example has got wonderful blueberry, blackberry, spice, leather, and mint leaf. In the mouth, it's a really complex, extremely well-structured wine. This is a wine that needs time. Not only does it take time to create, it needs time in the cellar to really evolve. It's not the wine for the beginner, but it is certainly one to satisfy the collector. Our journey ends here in Milano. And like the rest of Italy, there's both beauty and style. It occurs to me that a wine label is as important as a label on a designer's dress. In both cases, it carries the brand image. We want to know the origin, and we want to know the story. As we've seen, the story of Italian wine spans the centuries. The history, wine regulations, label terms, and diverse range of styles can be intimidating. To those of us who love them, if you can invest a little time and some effort to understand them, it can be the start of a beautiful relationship. We wanted to uh, reproduce some of the uh, latest uh, novelties back in the uh, European capitals in Milano, you find such stores um, on, since uh, last year, so it's uh, something really new also in Italy, in Barcelona there is another one. We thought that the uh, Philippines and Metro Manila in particular was ready for uh, such a concept and this is what we have decided to do, we came up with 
something new for this. The name is Massimo Trulli, Fashion, Food and Wine. So when you talk of fashion, in Italian fashion, you talk about bags, shoes. So since we have the brand, we're partners with, uh, with Massimo Trulli, the, the artist. We came up with a boutique and then we are showcasing also the furniture line that he has come up with a few years ago only. No? It's a recent uh, development. And then since we're importing the wines and also the deli, the Italian, all Italian wines, it's here also in, the, in, in, in this concept. And then we have also the restaurant, so that, but we are serving international food. So the, the, the cuisine is international, so you can enjoy everything here. You can be here to dine or just to have a glass of wine, or you can be here as well to shop, or you can do everything. So that's what we want uh, the, our clients to, to have, a different experience. There is so much competition, not by chance, we are in a LRI Design Plaza. And we are here because we have something to offer also from this point of view, the furniture. This is furniture from a designer, premium designer, which is unknown in, in the Philippines. And we are uh, ex exclusive to him and he's one of our partners. And as you can see, this furniture of high quality, so the highest quality together with these leather products. And uh, I, I'm sure we, we, it was a choice not to go to the malls because we wanted this to be a destination place. Also because of the character we wanted to assign to it. If you can see all the, the details are thought of, we thought of the lights, everything. You, can, you're, you see the furniture, the furniture, they are numbered furniture. They are 100% made in Italy and they are authenticated. There is a certificate of authentication of authenticity no, from, the, from the, the designer and it is also signed by him. So also the bags, they are limited numbers. For each design, he only produced 999 all over the world. For the furniture, 99. It's a lifestyle experience. It's why when whoever enters here, they can enjoy different aspects of the modern lifestyles of the Metro Manila, you know. And <laughs> Filipinos may well. travel. I mean, we believe that Filipinos now, no matter from what walk of life, I mean, you travel. So we know that somehow they, they know this, all the elements of this place, they already know. Except that what we did now here is we put everything in one place. Yeah. So you will have a different experience. Like the wines that we're serving here, we're not just selling them. We educate people about them. We are both sommeliers of the Italian Guild. So what we do, every wine producing country has its own approach to wine. We are bringing here the Italian wine way of, of life. We were working close with the design, interior designer and the architect that they did this. We wanted to make sure that uh, to convey what was uh, exactly our concept. It's not only a restaurant, it's not only a wine bar, it's not only a furniture shop, it's not only a boutique, it's all together. It's everything that you, you know, enjoy. I believe that uh, the things we buy, they somehow represent what we think or how we feel. So you can see furniture, you can have your entire living area and you want all the pieces there. But it, one piece can also accent only the, your space. You feel like you want it for your dresser, then you put it there. It depends on your style, but this is what I'm saying. We want you to express yourself. There are things that when you see, ah, that's me, we want that. We want, we want you to, to, to have that and to have a choice because you see everywhere, they have classic and really very nice furniture. But the furniture that we have, that's something different, something alive, something with Original, colors. Original, unique. Yes. And you just think of the five-star hotels and casinos as well. When you come here, you are not just given the wine list and then you just order it. From the sommelier to when I'm here, I personally take the guests inside the wine cellar to show them and talk about the room. We have some, uh, uh, for instance, a very old great press over there. We do wine education and uh, we can uh, explain one by one all our wines. It's not, and our wines are, the quality is very high as well. You were talking about quality. So our uh, low aim uh, wine is, uh, is so good that in the five stars hotels, uh, at the, their, uh, you know, uh, lower ends uh, cannot be even comparable. We're doing this for passion. I'm a lawyer, I'm still practicing. Uh, Mr. Stefanuti here was a former diplomat. 
So we're doing this because we want to give our clients a different experience. So this is a touch that is not I mean, present in any other yeah. establishment. Because uh, I mean, you can replicate the concept, but the personal touch, the experience that we have, is something you cannot replicate because it's our touch, it's not anyone else's. The Icardi Vineyards were established in 1914 near the town of Castiglione Tinella, located between two of the most celebrated winemaking terroir, the Langhi and Monferrato. In the early 1960s, Cavalier Pierino, with the support of his diligent wife Rosanna, decided to start making their own wine from the grapes they grew rather than sell them to the industry. And this was how they posed the cornerstone of their winemaking philosophy. Claudio, enologist, has furthered the work begun by his father by enlarging the vineyards to their present 75 hectares, partly extending around the original historic centre of the company, while the rest is distributed in various zones throughout the Lange and Monferrato. The location of the land is crucial to the quality of the wines produced, placing an emphasis on organic farming and 10 hectares of biodynamic vineyards. The focal point of the vineyard is to create the healthy soil of a century ago in order to guarantee excellent grapes. Claudio and Maria Grazia, notwithstanding their distinct personalities, find harmony and balance through hard work, with Claudio attending the vineyards while Maria Grazia deals with international marketing. Their winemaking philosophy is born in the vineyards and is carried on with great care and dedication in the wine cellars to exalt the best qualities of the grapes gathered at their peak during harvest time. Each phase of the winemaking process is enveloped in its own particular right, which testifies to the love and passion they have for this work. Organic and biodynamic wines require particular care and attention, such as constant observation of Mother Nature and her cycles, the weather and the climate. The result is wine that stands out by its distinct natural aroma, which varies as much as the land where it is grown and the people who grow it. The key is to conserve the integral characteristics of each crew.
wines tend to be fruity with extreme refinement, smoothness and elegance, allowing the mouth to relish their balance as soon as they are bottled. Even our most important wines can be enjoyed without aging. All of these characteristics, the fruit of our experience and constant research, make the Acardi style known throughout the world. Now you also brought a Barolo today, which is made from the Nebbiolo grape. Why do you feel Barolo is a great area to grow Nebbiolo? I cannot tell you why they grow, Nebbiolo grows uh, so good and uh, so well in the area. But if you, can, if you start to drink, you see that this characteristic, uh, they grow only in, uh, in Barolo and for me in Barbaresco. Now in the past 30 years, this tradition of, of blending uh, Nebbiolo from different parts of Barolo uh, has declined in favor of, of single vineyards. We completely change uh, our way of thinking uh, of Barolo. It's true that my father was starting, uh, he started to make a, a blend between different uh, vineyards. The history of Cerreto was this. He broke up mm, with my grandfather Riccardo. He decided to make his own Cerreto style because we, mm, we didn't own any vineyards. He started to vinify what were the best uh, uh, crews or single vineyards, uh, how you want to call, in the Barolo. Uh, to understand what to buy. He also understood that there was so many big difference because of the exposure, because of the altitude, because of the soil, that probably they were um, good enough to subline and to start to make uh, single vineyards. The Barolo that you brought today is the from the Prapo vineyard in Seralunga. And Seralunga is known for wines that age a long time long with, time. with plenty of structure. How does that differ from other areas in Barolo? It's the soil, it's the climate, it's the altitude. If you have to consider that Prapo, it's always picked at least 10 days after La Mora. So it's, um, it's a completely different terroir in uh, 10 kilometers of dif distance. Right now, what we're gonna drink, it's a Seralunga wine. Being higher, uh, higher altitude makes you, I can say, not easier, but better wines because you can leave the grapes a bit more to ripe, where in uh, vineyards facing south or more uh, or warmer com compared to Seralunga, you cannot wait and you have to pick because if not you will make a jam or a really, really high, high alcohol wine. For me this is a very typical Barolo because I love the expression of, of the cherry fruit, of the red fruit, but then you also get uh, flavors of tar, of licorice, of some herbs or and spices, you know, maybe even a, a, a little tobacco. Alessandro, what's your favorite part of making Barolo? Making Barolo is an, is an art, but the artist is the climate and the terroir. So what I have to do is to respect the terroir because I cannot change the climate. So I'm learning a lot because before I was starting my uh, harvest, knowing already my target. Today is completely changed. If you talk about RNAs, it's more um, a wine that I know what I expect from this wine, so I'm trying to uh, reach it every year. In the Barolo, I'm not, I'm not because uh, a vintage could be thinner, another one could be fatter, one is tannic and one is not. Before, I was trying to correct it, um, a sort of surgery. The winemaker passes, the terroir remains. And this is the, uh, the lesson that my father said to me when he started to make wine. And only right now, after 10, 15 vintages, I, I understood it. There is a magic place nestled within the peaceful hills of Friuli Venezia Giulia, a place which for centuries has been able to please the taste buds of the whole world. That place is San Daniele the ideal and virtually unique place to enable Italy's famous cured ham, prosciutto, to mature. The delicate and unmistakable taste of San Daniele ham is the way it is because San Daniele is where it is. Our cured ham is the result of a happy blend of factors which are based on an ancient Celtic and then later Roman tradition of conserving meat. 
It is directly from the fresh legs of pork, or haunches, all guaranteed DOP, that is, from one of the 11 recognized areas of northern and central Italy, that the long journey begins. A journey which lasts well over a year and which finally transforms the fresh haunches into genuine, certified San Daniele ham. And still today, the preparation of our prosciutto is carried out by traditional means while naturally respecting the most modern hygiene standards set by European law. Trimming is sometimes necessary to correct any imperfections in the cutting carried out in the abattoir and to identify possible traces of clotting or bruising which might lie under the skin. In order to earn the value DOP recognition, the legs of pork delivered into the production process must not weigh less than 12 kilos and must always conform to the strict health and hygiene standards imposed and overseen by the Consortio. It is only after these controls and checks that the skin can be given its special DOT brand a brand that indicates the beginning of the transformation process and which remains visible throughout. A series of signs impressed upon the outer skin complete the process of identifying each ham. The haunches are now separated according to weight laid upon special shelving and left to acclimatize for 24 hours at a temperature of between minus 1 and plus 3 degrees and with controlled humidity between 85 and 90 percent before the salting process begins. The salting of San Daniele ham is carried out naturally and follows the golden rule which declares that the leg must remain under salt for one day for every kilo of weight. The haunches are covered with salt ad libitium, that is, with no pre-specified quantity, which is then carefully spread by hand. The salt used in this process is exclusively Italian sea salt, prepared with medium fine grains and high relative humidity. It is wholly without additives, as this is forbidden by DOP rules. The recognized practice establishes that the pork haunches must be laid horizontally in a special environment, known as of the first salting and kept at a constant temperature of between minus one and plus four degrees with 90% humidity. Towards the midway stage in this operation, the work is repeated. This involves removing the remaining salt from the outside surface of the haunch and then massaging it with a special vibrating machine. To ensure the removal of every remaining trace of liquid from within the main femoral artery, special manual pressure is exerted on the horn. San Daniele ham can be recognized not only by its characteristic aroma, but also because of its typical guitar shape, which makes it unique and clearly recognizable at first sight. This highly original form is the result of the pressing stage, a phase typical of the production of San Daniele ham and which further encourages the penetration of the salt. And still today, this process is carried out as it once was, without the use of hydraulic presses. 
the transformation from Lega Pork into DOP San Daniele Prosciutto continues with the haunch being returned to the first salt room to complete its period of rest under the same conditions of temperature and humidity as before. After pressing, the haunches are hung for some 70 days in special cells with careful environmental controls, passing from 4 to 6 degrees to 7 to 9 degrees centigrade, with a variable humidity of from 70 to 85%. In this phase of curing, the hams are trimmed, after which the protruding section of the bone, caused by the reduction in the volume of the haunch, is removed, while some of the meat is also removed to enable more internal humidity to leave during the later phases. The next step is the refreshing phase and rinsing the haunch. Drying and prematuring are complementary steps and completes the delicate process of controlled dehydration and preparation for maturing, which takes place during a carefully balanced passage from temperature controlled environments to a natural temperature. The haunches remain in prematuring for 35 to 40 days with increasing drawing times. And after so much work, finally, a well deserved rest. Yes, because it is especially through rest that all the characteristics which give San Daniele ham its unique taste are awakened. The hill of San Daniele is morainic and not far from the foothills of the pre-alpine mountains and is washed along its base by the waters of the river Taliamento. Cold air from the north, warm air from the Adriatic, united by the river flow, create natural air conditioning. This gentle but consistent breeze makes San Daniele the classical textbook example of the ideal conditions for maturing prosciutto. And it is through these banks of windows that this special air, which makes San Daniele's perfect microclimate, can enter the rooms dedicated to natural maturing. When the pre-maturing phase is over, the hams are laid out in large, well-ventilated rooms for final curing, where they remain for some eight months. Within these rooms, normally towards the seventh month from the beginning of the whole process, a first light larding is carried out. This is repeated after the eighth month. The lard is a mixture of lard, salt, pepper and flour and is spread by hand over the exposed surface at the flat end of the haunch. This is done to protect and soften the exposed surface. It guarantees the process of osmosis between the body of the muscle and the external environment. The nature of the climatic conditions within the curing room is controlled by opening the numerous windows and depends on the outside weather conditions. It is for this reason that the hams are moved periodically to other curing rooms. In the final, delicate stage, daily checks are carried out within the room. With reference to this, since 1998, San Daniele has applied the standards laid down by the INEQ Institute. Inspectors from the INEQ visit the curing rooms on a daily basis to check on the progress of the maturing process by means of so-called boring, which involves inserting a fine horse bone needle into the ham. This boring is carried out on the femoral artery and can detect either the classic aromas of San Daniele Prosciutto or any traces of possible defects. 
After these checks, the supervisors from the consortio are informed about the condition of the cured ham. Once the perfect condition of the ham is ascertained, and after at least 12 months, the skin is branded with the symbol of the consortio and the identification number of the producer. The prosciutto, now that the production cycle has been successfully completed, can be boned and packed whole or in sections. Or it can be sliced, but only within the area of production, and sold in modified atmosphere packaging. Authenticity, tradition and guaranteed quality, as well as heritage and harmony, are all confirmed by the brand on each and every San Daniele ham, nurtured in our San Daniele air, air which brings celebration to the taste buds of the world. <laughs>